Well, thank you everyone for, uh, for coming today. We're very pleased today to have Dr. Trishette Jackson. She's a professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Jackson earned her PhD from U University of Washington in 1998, where she was funded through an NSF graduate fellowship. She then completed her postdoc at Duke. Uh, your achievements are absolutely spectacular. I had to go through your CV. I was like, I don't know which one to choose, right? So um, she's received an Alfred Sloan Award, the Blackwell Tapia Award, and Simons Foundation Fellowship. And she was voted in as a fellow of the inaugural class of the Association of Women in Mathematics. Um, I first saw you actually in a poster uh, for the American Association for uh, Women in Mathematics. So that's how I knew of you. Um, so like I said, it would take me way too long to keep talking about her achievements, and I really want to hear her talk. Um, your work in mathematical oncology and mathematical modeling of, infection, of infectious diseases has resulted in several publications in very prestigious journals. Um, and I, it, I have a funny story. So um, I first actually met you in person at BCU at the BAM conference, but I was under uh, as a postdoc uh, and, and as a graduate student, I had a quote unquote bad habit of not reading names on papers. So I would just read the papers and ignore the names. So in the middle of your talk, I was like, oh my god, that's a paper that I'm reading right now, because I was actually using your paper to do something that I was working on. So um, after that, I was like, mm, maybe I should start paying attention to names. <laughs> um, so uh, I, it, it was a really good talk, so I am sure that we're going to see a very good talk again today. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Labenbacher for inviting her today. Um, as postdocs like me, and like Abhishek, and all the other uh, and graduate students here, we have a lot to learn from such a successful uh, person in uh, mathematical oncology. So I don't want to delay this talk anymore because I'm so excited. Uh, so without, uh, without any more delay, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Tushet talk today about multi-scale modeling of traditional and targeted anti-cancer therapies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. That was an amazing introduction. Um, <laughs> over, overly flattering. I really appreciate it. Except for mentioning the dates. I, I, I appreciate everything except for the 19th. <laughs> I'd also like to thank um, you and Reinhardt for the very kind invitation to come and share some of the kinds of things I've been doing lately. But to be really honest, I am more excited for this afternoon where I get to hear about some of the great things that are going on here at uh, UConn Health and at Jackson Laboratories in um, cancer research and specifically, but in more generally just quantitative medicine, which I, um, which I enjoy. So let's just jump right in. A few of you may have read this article that appeared in Time Magazine a few years ago. The cover was How to Cure Cancer. And then you flipped open to the article and there's the big headline, the hero scientist who defeats cancer will likely never exist. And they went on to describe cancer in this very uh, eloquent way. They said, it is an intricate and potentially lethal collaboration, lethal collaboration of genes gone awry, growth inhibitors gone missing, hormones and epigenomes changing, rogue cells breaking free. It works as the equivalent, uh, um, it works as a great armed force attacking by the equivalent of land, air, and sea in stealth. And we think we're going to take it out with what? A lab-coded sniper. So the last sentence is perhaps a bit too playful, but the rest of that description is actually quite intentional, right? A lethal collaboration. It's bringing to mind the multifaceted nature of, of cancer. And the reason there will likely not be a, a hero is because there will be many heroes. We need to form our own lethal collaborations of multifaceted expertise and bring all of this synergistically to bear on this disease, right? So this is not a picture from the Time Magazine article, but they did mention all the usual suspects, pathologists and biomedical scientists. They even mentioned biomedical engineers, informaticists, of course, oncologists, but they left out mathematical and com computational modelers. So I had to include us because I think we um, should be a part of this conversation. I think there is room, there's a place for us, there's space for us to be real contributors to the next phase of cancer research. And I know I'm preaching to the choir probably here, but I really do believe that we have a role to play 
in um, delivering results uh, faster and putting our, our expertise into the, into the pot and mixing it all up as well. All right, so even though cancer is the name given to over 200 genetically distinct diseases, if you look at solid tumors, many of them progress in similar ways. Um, so maybe starting with a series of mutations, so this acquisition of mutation transforms the cells. They begin growing inside um, whatever tissue. Uh, and then they need to initiate angiogenesis or blood vessel formation, connect themselves to our vascular supply. They begin to evade, invade and then metastasize to other sites. So those four steps um, in solid tumors are, are pretty common. And if you think about these four steps either alone, either as a progressive trajectory or think about aspects of each one of them individually, you really begin to see that cancer, um, like many other biological systems, is a complex system that operates across many uh, biological scales, spatial scales, temporal scales. And depending on the questions you're asking, the questions you want to answer, you may use different types of mathematics or computational approaches to address those questions. So if you're starting to think about things along the lines of intracellular signaling networks that are important or maybe disrupted in cancer, you may use a certain type of mathematics to address those questions. If you're up here at the population level, you can use different types of mathematics to answer those questions. But more and more commonly today, we are trying to understand the integrated connectedness of all of these scales, right? And that's why sort of these regions aren't, aren't sharply defined over here. The lines are a little bit blurred because we're really trying to connect these scales. And the, the connections I try to make in my work are these. I'm looking at intracellular signaling pathways, how they um, impact single cell decisions, and how that results in tissue level observables that I get most of my data on, which is just tumor reduction over time or tumor growth over time. Right? But we know things at all of these lower uh, scales impacted those data. So we try to connect the scales in that way. I've been interested lately in um, developing models of targeted molecular therapeutics, which differs from our traditional chemotherapeutic approaches where you give some sort of type uh, cytotoxic drug um, that will attack rapidly dividing cells. It differs because we're trying to bring a level of specificity to our approach to, to um, destroying these cells. So um, people, my collaborators and others around the, the world are designing drugs that interfere with either specific cells or enzymes or proteins or molecules on cells um, that are necessary for a specific kind of cancer's growth. So really using that own that, that, that unique cancers make up to try to um, target um, those particular cells, right? So the idea is to bring precision to cancer uh, treatment and lower the amount of side effects. So I'm going to tell you the story of two types, two different types of targeted molecular therapeutics that I've been looking at, and I'm going to start with models that, um, or mathematical models that look at giving uh, drugs that block angiogenesis. So we're going to target blood vessel formation first in this first line of research. So the picture above shows a tumor growing off in the distance. And when uh, tumors reach um, a nutrient limited size, it's believed they begin secreting a wide variety of um, growth factors and angiogenic stim stimulators. The most common one is vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, right? It has to sort of diffuse into the surrounding tissue, make its way to a neighboring blood vessel that uh, shouldn't be too far away. It then begins to bind and dimerize receptors um, on the endothelial cell surfaces and um, to begin to initiate the, the cascade of events known as angiogenesis. So once binding and dimerization occurs, 
all the intracellular, all these different intracellular lights start flashing and pathways are initiated and excited, um, pathways that lead to cell survival, cell movement, migration, cell proliferation, and um, all of those things, uh, vascular permeability, all of those things lead into successful uh, vascularization of a tumor. So lots of uh, intracellular things uh, that um, sort of stimulate and are required for successful angiogenesis to occur. So if, this, if we know that this is what's happening, the idea with anti-angiogenic treatment, of course, is if you're starting with a tumor that initiates uh, blood vessel formation via the secretion of these growth factors begins to grow, we want to, of course, sorry, we want to, of course, try to block this in some way. And if we could stop blood vessel formation from uh, occurring, from forming, from continuing on, we could hopefully shrink the tumors back down to these more harmless um, sort of nutrient-limited sizes in the body. So that's the idea of the therapy. Now, if we want to block this, how might we, how might we do that? Well, there's many ways, just listening to that very brief description of the process. You can already uh, think of uh, three, three ways that might work. Well, I could stop the tumor cells themselves from producing these growth factors, angiogenic stimulators. Maybe I could design some way of, of a drug that would do that. I could design a drug that neutralizes or sequesters the growth factor while it's um, making its way to a neighboring blood vessel before it ever gets there. So I could sequester or neutralize it, trap it somewhere in the, in the, in the tissue. Or I could design a drug that actually blocks the interaction of these um, growth factors on the receptor. So I could block the actual signal on endothelial cells. So those are three potential ways we could target angiogenesis and maybe have some impact on slowing or stopping the process. So my collaborators uh, really wanted to look at this and um, get a good idea about what was going on in the head and neck uh, squamous cell carcinomas that they look at. So they designed a method to um, view human tumors growing in mice but being fed by human blood vessels. So it was important to them that the vascular structure they were studying was as close to human and not mouse as, as they could get. So they um, took some human uh, cancer cells and uh, mix them with human endothelial cells. They supersaturate a polymer scaffold with those cells and plant that scaffold in a mouse. Uh, angiogenesis begins to happen. And for about the first three to four weeks, you actually get a growing, thriving tumor where the vascular makeup is almost entirely human. So after the first month or so, then mouse blood vessel cells start to infiltrate and take over. Um, and of course, it's the, the mouse blood that's feeding the tumor, but the vessel structure itself is almost entirely human for the first month or so. So they grew these tumors and then looked at what was happening um, with the cancer cells and the vasculature as the tumors were growing. Not, su not surprisingly, they found VEGF was the important mediator of angiogenesis. They found that BCL2, um, an intracellular survival protein, was critically important. They have lots of data showing how um, uh, the upregulation of BCL2 really caused these tumors to be uh, larger, more, vascul more vascularly complex. And if you were to block BCL2, you'd get very, very small tumors. So BCL2 pro-survival in these endothelial cells was a critical mediator, not only it, on its own, but because it also stimulated the um, upregulation of a, of a second really potent um, mitotic factor and my, uh, migratory signal in IL-8 or CXCL-8. So they discovered this pathway and thought that it was the one that seemed to be driving what they were seeing um, in these head and neck cancers. This isn't all they found, though. So they also found this interesting crosstalk was happening. So the traditional story of tumor angiogenesis is a one-sided story. Cancer cells aren't so happy. They're not getting enough nutrients. They're not ex uh, expending their waste properly. They secrete um, growth factors and get blood vessels to grow towards them. All tumor-initiated, one-sided story. They really found that there's this complex dialogue 
between the cancer cells and um, the endothelial cells uh, beyond just the vascular support that they provide. So they found that um, these tumor cells actually began to overexpress a receptor for the growth factor that they're producing. So they began to produce, they began to overexpress a VEGF receptor, R1, that's normally expressed mostly on endothelial cells. So when they secrete um, VEGF, it does bind to the, the, v, the receptors on endothelial cell surfaces, causes those proliferatory and survival effects, but it also causes the endothelial cells to secrete more VEGF themselves. So tumors trick, uh, tumor cells trick the endothelial cells into producing VEGF, for which it now also has a receptor giving it a, my, uh, a proliferative and survival advantage over and above um, what it had before. So this, this complicated crosstalk between the, the two types of cells was um, where they wanted to focus um, and to, to really figure out, tease out, if you're targeting um, angiogenesis, you know, what is causing the major impact? Is it the fact that I'm blocking the blood vessels themselves, or is it the fact that I'm blocking this crosstalk? that's really leading to the therapeutic uh, results that we're seeing. So that actually leads us to a fourth potential target. Now that we know that these head and neck cancers begin to upregulate these receptors um, and also can initiate signals that um, give them proliferative and survival cues, we could try to inhibit design drugs that inhibit the receptors on the tumor cells that, pr that promote this growth and survival. So we've got all these different options, and we want to know which option would be best or how to combine these options in the most uh, optimal way. So here's uh, why we need mathematical modeling. Um, so there are drugs out there that do these things, all four of those things, but before they become successful as on their own as a single modality treatment, or in combination with traditional chemotherapies, we really have to get a better understanding of what's causing their anti-tumor effects. So we've got two cellular compartments. We've got the endothelial cells, we've got the tumor cells who are in communication with each other in interesting ways. So we don't really know. Um, we know that the tumor might be shrinking, but we don't know what's causing um, that, that um, effect. So we, maybe a mathematical model could help shed some light on what's going on there and also maybe to shed some light on which tumor phenotypes are going to show the greatest benefit to some of these different kinds of targeting um, therapy strategies. So we have been building models of um, this kind of uh, dynamic for quite a while, and our models operate at three levels. So at the, at the kind of population level, we've got tumor cells, we've got endothelial cells, we've got microvessels, and of course, we've got the whole loop of their life cycle and their story together with hypoxia mediating the EGF production, mediating um, survival and proliferation of, of endothelial cells, leading to blood vessels which feed the tumor. We've got all that in the models. But then we also have the signal um, initiating um, events, so the molecular level of VEGF binding, dimerizing receptors on the surface of now endothelial cells, and now we know it does the same thing for receptors on the surface of tumor cells and leading to these intracellular dynamics that block apoptosis and increase proliferation. So we've got some intracellular um, connections in the models for both cell types now as well. So because all of the data that I have access to and that I get from my collaborators is temporal, we developed models to look at the temporal evolution so first, so so far we've just been looking at the temporal evolution of these main players. And our goal was to link the signal initiation, which is the receptor ligand binding, right, to the signal that it produces, the intracellular survival signals or proliferative signals, and figure out how that would impact the big picture that we see, which is cell number, right, tumor growth and survival over time. So this is the general framework broken down in a, in a simplified way. Um, if we consider just a general signaling protein that div 
um, calling it A. It, debind, it binds directly to receptors on cell surfaces. It forms some sort of complex connection with those receptors. And then it's going to elicit a couple of different responses. But before we get to those responses, very easy to write down equations for the binding dynamics of the, of the protein with the receptor and the complex it forms. However, because these um, um, signaling molecules are binding to receptors on a growing tumor, my cell numbers are changing, right? I have to make sure that I add in new receptors as cells divide, and I subtract off um, receptors as cells die. Um, but, the, but the key thing I want from this kind of model is I want to know the signal initiator, the, the complex formation that starts the signal. So I keep track of the fractional occupancy of those receptor complexes. So I take the total number of complexes divided by the total number of cells and the total number of receptors per cell. That is my fractional occupancy. And when that is high enough, of course, I should get some signal generated downstream inside the cell. So the two responses that the complex elicits, we're assuming is a one that's a little bit more direct, right, and impacts tumor proliferation and then one that goes through the intracellular um, cascade of upregulating something like BCL2, like a pro-survival protein. So we use this fractional occupancy to um, mediate tumor growth and mediate um, upregulation of a pro-survival protein that then mediates tumor cell death. Okay? So that's the simplified view of the strategy. Of course, things are more complex in the situation I'm interested in, because I have two different types of cells. I've got, at the cellular level, I have to keep track of endothelial and tumor cells. And then at the molecular level, even though I only have one signaling molecule, I've got two different types of receptors on um, endothelial cells and one type of receptor on tumor cells that I have to keep track of. And VEGF doesn't just bind and form a complex. VEGF actually dimerizes these receptors. So we have to keep track of all of that kind of dynamics in our, in our mathematical model as well. And then we have two, the two different um, VCL2 uh, upregula upregulation variables, one for endothelial cells and one for tumor cells. So that general strategy just expanded out to uh, fit more uh, accurately the situation we're interested in with tumor cell endothelial cell crosstalk. All right, so again, it's these fractional occupancies now of dimerized receptors per cell on tumor cells, T, and on endothelial cells that are going to connect my um, intracellular scale to my tissue level or cellular scale. So these molecular level details are the connectors. All right, so what kinds of therapies are we going to consider? We're going to consider two different types of therapies, but um, in, in a couple different ways. So the first type is the ligand trap therapy, the sequestering of the growth factor before it ever gets there, the neutralizing of the EGF. So that's VEGF floating around freely, and then you've got some drug that kind of just traps it, swallows it up, sequesters it before it can have its impact. And then we're going to consider also um, anti-VEGF receptor anti-VEGFR antibodies or antibody-like molecules that operate at the receptor level that block, that kind of compete for VEGF spot on the receptors, blocking the dimerization of our receptors, right? And we can do that on tumor cells and we can do that on endothelial cells. So we want to use the model to investigate these kinds of ligand traps versus these antibody strategies either alone or in combination to see what kinds of effects we might get on the tumor. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this, but we were able to find lots of parameters in the literature on things uh, like binding dynamics and dimerization rates for VEGF. It's a well-studied molecule. We've got a lot of information on that just from the literature. My collaborators were able to do some experiments to give us some information about VEGF production levels by both endothelial cells and tumor cells for the kinds of tumors they work on and also on the expression levels of BCL2 for the types of um, tumors that they work on. And not only that, we were able to get some time course data for the effect of VEGF on cell proliferation and the effect of BCL2 on cell survival, which is all very helpful in calibrating and training our mathematical model before we actually make any predictions. Treatment data, we were able to get some data for um, 
control versus treatment with two different levels of uh, ligand trap, uh, like Avastin. Um, and we get information on the tumor volume and it, uh, over time, and also the vascular density for um, these different kinds of drugs. So this is all the information that we use to kind of train the model. And here's some of the things the model can begin to tell us. So first of all, we're just going to look at one treatment at a time. Let's just look at uh, a ligand trap that sequesters or neutralizes the, the VEGF. So what I'm showing here is tumor volume versus time. We are treating um, on days one and five for four weeks. So for 28 days in this gray shaded region, I am treating these growing tumors with Avastin, followed by a full three weeks off, so a total 49-day uh, treatment period on off treatment cycle. So the black is the control, and then we hit it with um, two and four milligrams of uh, mix per kg of um, an Avastin type drug. So we fit our mathematical model. So we had almost all the parameters, believe it or not, from the literature and from our collaborators. But there were a few that we didn't have. So we're able to fit our model to this, mat to this data, which is actually this same data, just uh, showing our models fit to that data. And um, the fit looked pretty good. So we see, yes, tumor reduction when you um, give these drugs. What we wanted to also look at, since we have this mathematical model, was tumor oxygenation. So we've got um, the vascular proportion in the tumor, so the number of endothelial cells over the total number of cells in the tissue, which we assume is, uh, is going to give us um, the, um, the oxygen or, or um, oxygen in the, in the tissue, so it's going to be proportional to that vascular proportion. And if we make that assumption, we can look at oxygen pressure over this whole treatment cycle as well. And we notice a couple of different things. So first of all, the high dose has a very slow exit from hypoxia, while the low dose treatment has a very rapid exit from hypoxia. So what this tells us is that the anti-VEGF therapy, the sequestering therapy at low doses is able to neg negate the effect of VEGF on the tumor cells, right? Because we definitely get a huge drop in tumor growth, but is not able to induce high degrees of vascular disruption because we have high levels of oxygen left in the tumor. So we have a better oxygenated tumor and maybe a therapeutic window for following up with other drugs that are uh, blood-borne, other chemotherapies that you might want to deliver with an intact vac vascular system. And you don't quite get that with these higher doses. So that's one treatment. Now we have two others to consider. And the way we're going to do this is by, by comparing them. So we're going to compare what we just looked at, which was the ligand trap therapy with therapies that block receptors on endothelial cells versus blocking uh, receptors on tumor cells. The way we're going to do this comparison is we're looking at the normalized tumor volume on the last day of the cycle, day 49. So that means I've treated for four weeks. I've been off for three weeks. Um, and um, it's normalized by the control, um, the, the control level of cells. And then we're going to see what happens as we increase the drug dose. And this is the normalized drug dose. The drug doses are normalized by their IC50s. All right, so what are we seeing here? So let's look at blue first, which is just the ligand trap. Right, so as you increase the drug dose, as you might expect, you get uh, smaller tumors by the end of day 49. Makes sense. If we look at what happens if we block receptors on tumor cells, it tracks right along with um, the ligand trap therapy for quite a while, for quite a, a large range of drug doses. But then there's a threshold effect, right? If I give drug greater than threshold, right, I get this um, enhanced impact of this therapy. Right? So that's because it, uh, this drug is having two impacts on the tumor cells, an anti-proliferative effect and an anti-survival effect. So when those two things finally come together, we get this nice drop in tumor growth by day 49. The interesting one occurs when you just look at what happens if you block receptors on endothelial cell surfaces. Right? For, the, for the initial um, drug concentrations considered, we get higher numbers of tumor cells by the end of the treatment cycle um, than we would expect, right? So the tumor actually is not responding to, to these lower doses of the therapy. And it's only when you get um, to higher doses that you see some leveling off. So the reason for this is that 
if you're blocking receptors from these uh, endothelial cells and this interesting crosstalk is going on, well, of course, you just freed up a lot of VEGF for the tumor cells to make use of, and they make use of it, and uh, begin to grow as much as they can. But then vasculature begins to be disrupted, and so even though we have lots of cells, there's nothing feeding it, so of course we get an, an eventual decline. So we can also look at the oxygen uh, uh, pressure over that same course. So this is over the 49 days, and again, drug dose here. So for the ligand trap, we see very little change in oxygena oxygenation um, in the tumor over these different dosing, um, as dose increases. For the therapy that blocks receptors on tumor cells, we see increased oxygenation as the tumor shrinks, right? So we got this drop in tumor size, but this increase in oxygenation, which is good. Smaller tumors with better vasculature can be followed up with second lines uh, with, a, with a, another type of therapy. Um, and then for the therapies that block receptors on endothelial cell surfaces, we get a massive drop in vascular and oxygenation, of course, because we're blocking directly blood vessels. But during this time, the tumor is still actively trying to grow, right? So we get these larger tumors that are poorly vascularized, probably difficult to treat with additional blood-borne therapies. All right, so that's each of the three alone, kind of comparing them all. Let's see what happens if we start giving them in combination. So here we're going to have, again, tumor volume over our full treatment cycle, 21 days on, three weeks off. I'm sorry, 28 days on, three weeks off. But now we're going to give the treatments either alone at their IC50s or in combination with each other or all three at the same time. So I know some of these lines kind of overlap, so I'm just going to label these two as our least effective because the tumor is always, the, the cell numbers are always the highest, right? It's not really doing much in terms of reduction. And if you look at what two therapies those were, interesting enough, it was the uh, ligand trap therapy and the, um, the therapy that blocks receptors on tumor cell surfaces. So the ones that seem to be doing better as we increase the dose, if we treat at the IC50, they're actually kind of doing the worst. Then we see several um, situations where I get a decent amount of tumor reduction during the treatment window, but this rapid regrowth after the treatment window ends. And all of those have uh, their, all of those combinations um, have uh, the therapy that blocks receptors on the endothelial cells as a component. So anytime I'm blocking receptors on the endothelial cells, I might do well during treatment, but I'm getting this rapid regrowth afterwards. And there is just one strategy that seemed to kind of outshine the rest, right, um, during treatment and after treatment. And that happened to be the combination of these two, right? So the combination of the ligand trap and the therapy that um, blocks receptors on tumor cells actually works synergistically when combined together. And they gave us the best results. We can also take a look just to see what the oxygenation looks like for these tumors. Again, the therapy that worked the best in term of, terms of tumor, uh, tumor reduction also did the best in terms of preserving vasculature and increasing um, oxygen concentration. So these are the, also the tumors that would likely do better with an additional chemotherapy added later. And the ones that um, were uh, growing slowly during the treatment window and then had rapid regrowth had the least oxygenation. So they had the, the most poor um, oxygen tensions during treatment and even after treatment. So these uh, cancer cells, even though they're trying to grow really rapidly, right, the, the vessels are being um, blocked quite substantially. So you're getting poor, larger, poorly vascularized tumors, this combination. Okay, just one final way of looking at all this. This kind of summarizes everything we found. It's just a graph showing what we want. What we want is growth inhibition during the 28 days of treatment, right? And then we want, um, um, so, in, so in blue, we want to make sure inhibition is high during treatment. And then we want um, regrowth during the off phase to be as low as possible. So we want blue to be as high as possible and red to be as low as possible. 
and there's only one therapeutic combination that gives me a high level of reduction during my treatment phase and a low level of regrowth during my off, my three weeks off. And that was the combination of those two therapies. All right, so where are we going next with this line of research? Um, we would love to have some real in vivo validation of this, uh, of some of these results, and we'd also like to add chemotherapy. The reason I'm really stressing in vivo validation is because um, a lot of these things were tested in vitro first. A lot of these kinds of combinations were tested in vitro um, using sort of uh, co-cultures where you didn't actually have vasculature. You just had cells growing in response to the chemical uh, mediators that were produced by each other. And the results were totally different, totally different. Our model predicted that um, blocking um, receptors on endothelial cells in combination with any of the other therapies was synergistic in vitro, right, without the blood vessel dynamics and all of that. But we just saw that in vivo situations, we got the exact opposite effect. And any therapy where we blocked blood vessels uh, cells um, was always antagonistic. So we'd like some in vivo validation of some of these results. And then, like I said, most of the data that I've uh, captured or that I had access to uh, was temporal data. But really, tumors are growing in a spatial domain and have interesting morphologies. Um, and it would be nice to capture some of that with a spatial temporal model. It will impact oxygen delivery, drug delivery, all of those things and may make um, a big difference in some of the results that we're getting, so we'd love to do that. I'd also like to quantify the influence of spatially evolving tumor vascular outcomes. Now, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I know there are lots of groups out there who have these kinds of really nice multi-scale models that include um, complex vasculature. I would just like to find a way of including the molecular level detail of targeted therapeutics to some of these, um, these kinds of computational approaches. All right, so that's the one story. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time telling you about a second story. So we're also interested in cancer stem cells and targeting, um, and targeting them um, in order to hopefully um, send, to, send cancers into regression. So cancer stem cells, as you know, have been identified in a variety of malignancies. They're usually the minority. They're only a small fraction. They're, they're self-renewing. They are tumorigenic. It's believed that they can differentiate into all the other kinds of cancer cell types. And they're usually difficult to treat. They may be resistant uh, to drugs, radiation, and other um, stressors on the environment. So if you give a traditional therapy, um, it's believed that maybe you're killing off the bulk of the tumor cells, but that the cancer stem cells are kind of resistant to that traditional therapy. So even though you get this nice tumor reduction, eventually this cancer stem cell survived, so it's going to re relapse um, the entire tumor. But if you can find therapies that target those cancer stem cells, even if it left all the bulk tumor cells alone, eventually those tumor cells would die and you would not get regression. So that's the idea behind this targeting cancer stem cells. So for the types of cancers that my collaborators work on, these um, head and neck cancers, cisplatin is um, a carbon-based chemotherapy that is the most commonly used drug. Even though this is the cornerstone of treatment for these, uh, these kinds of tumors, it's still not great, right? Um, metastasis often occurs. Um, and even after treatment, recurrence occurs, but it's really the best that we've got. What they found, however, is that if you um, treat mice uh, with human tumors with cisplatin, so you give, you let the tumor grow, you treat it with cisplatin, and then you look at the stem cell fractions after treatment. This is control, and this is after tr treatment with cisplatin. Cisplatin actually increases the stem cell percentage in these tumors, which is not a good thing, right? We don't want more stem cells, we'd like less. So the question is, is it a numerator or a denominator effect, right? Am I just getting a higher proportion of stem cells because I killed off all the, the bulk cells, making the proportion higher? Or is this platin actually inducing some sort of self-renewal or some sort of mechanism in um, head and neck cancer cells? And, we, and uh, my collaborators believe that both of those things are happening. 
and we get these, these increases in stem cell number after treatment. So that leads us to want to look for things that can block stem cells from self-renewing. If we're going to give cisplatin, right, and we're going to have higher stem cell fractions, we need something to start blocking um, the properties that the stem cells have that cause them to self-renew and survive. So they found that IL-6 is um, secreted, importantly, by endothelial cells in the vasculature. And stem cells live in these perivascular niches, so they soak up all of this IL-6. And that's one of the mechanisms they can use to evade um, the chemotherapy and continue to um, divide, self-renew, and um, survive during that treatment. So the idea is to block IL-6 receptors at the same time or in some sort of combination, some sort of strategic way, along with traditional chemo chemotherapy. And maybe the combination of those two will have impact. So there's a couple different ways, of course, you could do this. So IL-6 binds to its receptor on cell surface, surfaces, recruits some co-receptors, and then all the classical signaling um, goes on. So we could use a ligand trap, block it from ever getting to the receptor, or design some sort of antibody that actually um, interferes or competes with IL-6 and stops the signaling. So there happens to be one such antibody, tocizilumab. I'm just going to call it TCZ. And they've done some in vivo and in, vivo, in vitro testing of this particular um, IL-6 blocker. And this is stem cell percentage and control. This is stem cell percentage after treatment and for in vitro and in vivo. So you get this decrease in stem cell percentage with, with this therapy, which is what they wanted it to do. So what do we need mathematical modeling for here? Well, now we know that the standard of care, which is cisplatin, um, and this IL-6 blocker, TCZ, affect the stem cell pool in opposing directions. One of the treatments increases it, one of them decreases it. So we want to use mathematical modeling to propose um, some sort of schedule for combination drug delivery that will impact the tumor in the, most, um, in the, in the best ways. All right, so the framework is still very similar to the last one. Um, since we already have the structure of a model that has endothelial cells and cancer cells, all we have to do is expand our cancer cell pool. Instead of one equation, we have to have stem cells and progenitor cells and fully differentiated cells. We already have a model that has you know, um, endothelial cells secreting. Um, uh, now we have them secreting the IL-6 that is going to impact the survival of these cells and the self-renewal of the stem cells. We have the tumor cells secreting the VEGF that impacts the, the, the vascu vascular structure. So we've got this kind of crosstalk now, but with a more enriched uh, kind of cancer cell pool, a more heterogeneous cancer cell uh, phenotypic pool of cells to deal with. But again, we need fractional occupancies of IL-6 on each of these cell types to drive survival and to drive proliferative effects. So these are our connections between the scales again. Um, so then we just write down equations for that follow the general cancer stem cell hypothesis of um, differentiation, amplification, and then um, terminal differentiation, and use those fractional occupancies in, this, in similar ways to affect self-renewal and survival in, in the different cell populations. So here are some of the results that we were getting. The first thing we did was um, we were able to get some data on what happens to the tumor versus time, control in black, treatment with cisplatin alone, so just with the chemotherapy alone in red. And um, so they gave the treatment on, um, oh, typo here, sorry, two different days. So they started treatment on day 23 in one situation and day 28 in the other, and that's what the two different red curves are. So we fit our model to the control and treatment data to estimate our parameters associated with cisplatin. And then we used our model to predict the stem cell percentage after treatment. So just as we thought we should, we get these increases. So here treatment was given on um, uh, once a week for three weeks, starting on either day 23 or 28. And uh, we see these increases in the stem cell pool after treatment, as we thought we should. So that's a model prediction. 
Then we looked at what if we give this IL-6 blocker on its own, this TCZ therapy on its own. Same situation, only now we're not fitting to any data. We're really proud of this. This is direct comparison of our model to this experimental data. Absolutely no parameters were fit. This is just laying our, our model over the data and we're getting fits like, and we're getting, um, um, I don't want to say fits, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting results that look um, this close to what they see experimentally. So again, this drug was given on day 23 and on day 28 and um, there's some tumor reduction, but here are predictions of stem cell percentages after treatment follow along what we think should happen, which is that stem cells should be reduced with this IL-6 blocker, and indeed they are. So the idea is to combine them. They had some data on that. Again, directly comparing our, data, our, our mathematical model, no additional parameter fitting at all, just directly comparing our model for combination therapy of cisplatin with this um, TCZ, um, and we see, again, uh, control and the two different time points for starting treatment, and we get that the combination actually um, does a very, very good job of, of, of uh, countering the increase that cisplatin would have had on its own. And if you take a look back at, at this slide, you'll see that the stem cell reduction kind of follows along with um, it actually might get a little bit, about the same amount of stem cell reduction as if you had uh, TCZ alone. So TCZ is really working hard to overcome what cisplatin was doing. Okay. All right, so then our job was really to try to figure out how to give this, how to give these drugs in combinations to have the, the best effect. So we computed a couple things, and this is still very much a work in progress, so I'm just presenting very preliminary uh, work here. But what we computed was the IC70, which is the amount of TCZ required for a 70% tumor reduction compared to control. And we did that um, at week uh, 10, looked at week 10. Then we computed something called the uh, signaling index, which we view as a measure of the synergism between, between drugs. <laughs> and <laughs> so what we do is for a particular dosing strategy, we um, look at the IC50, for example, of that dosing strategy, and then we change the dosing strategies and compute the ratio. So, for example, to get this number, to get the, the, the signaling index for this therapy, I take the IC70 here and, and its ratio to the control or baseline IC70. So we think that um, this gives us some idea of synergy. If numbers are bigger than one, of course, that's saying the treatments together are a little more, that schedule is a little more antagonistic. If numbers are less than one, it's saying that that uh, strategy is more synergistic. And then we also wanted to look at the reduction in stem cell percentage. So those are the three columns, IC70, signaling or scheduling index, and reduction in um, stem cells. So um, first, uh, a picture that I didn't show here. But here, in all of the data that I've shown here, they were given cisplatin once a week for three weeks, and then they would give um, TCZ once a week, but for the entire seven weeks of the, of, the, um, of the treatment cycle, right? So they were giving a lot of TCZ. It's not a cytotoxic drug, so it's okay. But we did simulations of that strategy of seven weeks of TCZ and found that it was giving you zero benefit. To, 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 to keep continuing to give TCZ. So what I'm showing you is what we found to be the best um, set of strategies, which is cisplatin once a week for three weeks. The yellow is our control. Cisplatin once a week for three weeks. Gray is when we give TCZ. So we're only giving TCZ for three weeks as well here. right? And our control is co-treatment, co-treatment of cisplatin and TCZ. Right? And, then watch, and then we watch what happens. So our preliminary results seem to suggest that pretreatment with cisplatin, so these ones up here, are the best for tumor reduction, right? So they're the best, um, for, I'm sorry, for, for cancer stem cell reduction. We get 50, up to 50%-ish reduction if we start pretreating with cisplatin. But if we look down here at synergies between the drugs, if we alternate, if we start with a pretreatment, uh, if we alternate, co-treating cisplatin 
and um, TCZ with a week on and a week off, we actually get the best synergistic combination, but a slight reduction in, uh, we, so we get much smaller ICE-70s, we're using less drug, and we have, um, we've, we've lost a little bit in terms of stem cell uh, a reduction, but we've gained a lot in these other areas. So we're still playing around with this. We're trying to figure out what we think the optimal strategies are, but we're, we're getting somewhere. So just to begin to close, we have um, developed this sort of versatile mathematical modeling framework. It does operate at the intracellular, cellular, and tissue levels, but only looks at, tem at temporal evolution of our key players. Even just looking at the temporal evolution, it was enough to be able to capture the, the mechanisms of action of these kinds of targeted uh, therapeutics and can be used to investigate the impact of this complex crosstalk between cancer and vasculature and how it might impact pack tumor growth or reduction to therapy. And hopefully, we'll show that it can be used to predict optimal dosing um, schedules and say something about potential synergism or a synergy, synergism or antagonism of combination therapies. All right. So here's where I'm going in the future with, with this project. Um, so my collaborators have already um, generated patient-derived xenografts, um, and they've got them all ready and waiting to test um, our, our optimal therapy to see if the how well the model is doing. I'm so nervous that I'm not telling them we're done, and <laughs> I want to keep... I want to keep, um, uh, I want to test some more uh, strategies to make sure before I have them actually tell me if the model's doing right or not, but we're, they're ready. They're ready to um, see if the model is, is um, predicting optimal therapies. And we also would love to get a spatial temporal version of this kind of approach where we have different types of cells, stem cells, which we know um, reside in different spatial locations near blood vessels. We've got the bulk cells, but I'd love to combine um, a molecular level of detail, the kind of detail necessary to really say something about the mechanism of action of these targeted therapies to such an approach. So that's where we'd like to go with that. Um, I'd just like to thank the people that I work with on this and the funding agencies that fund us. So Harsh Jane was a graduate student of mine at the University of Michigan. He's now an associate professor at Florida State, I think. And Faresh Janazari was a PhD student of mine who is now a postdoc at the University of Chicago. Alex was um, an NIH fellow that worked with, had a K award to work with me and Jacques Noor while he was at the University of Michigan. He just started his own lab at the University of Chicago and is doing great. And then my Michigan contingency, Jacques Noor and Alex Okaleas, who, uh, who are instrumental in the experiments that go along with this work. So thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? I had that question. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, so, like, I mean, I'm not sure how much, like, off-target uh, uh, things affect the uh, in vivo and, like, the model prediction, right? So, like, have you thought of, like, how to account for that? That's an excellent question. So off-target effects, I'm sure, are very important, especially for um, these kinds of, of drugs. We haven't included, it, included them in our model yet, but it's something we could definitely include to try to account for. The other thing that we haven't accounted for in this model that is something I've got a graduate student kind of working towards is with the cancer stem cell model, we know that um, quiescence could be a big factor and um, so we're building, we're expanding that model to include not only quiescence, but plasticity, the fact that the cells can de-differentiate and, and, um, and, um, and go back and forth between their stem cell phenotype. So there's, there's lots of, of room to, to make this better, and off-target therapies and quiescence are two things that we definitely would love to consider. I was interested that in your, you know, your proposed or uh, soon to be uh, ongoing experiments, you're, you're thinking of switching to a PDX model. Yeah. So, so that sort of has 
pluses and minuses. It really does. Um, and, and can you sort of talk a little bit about the, the, what went behind that decision? Yeah. I, so it's just, <laughs> and I did not want to switch, to be honest. So we had been using um, uh, xenografts where they just take um, human tumors and implant them on scaffolds and with endothelial cells, and I loved that setup. Uh, he, so my collaborators, for some reason, fell in love with these patient-derived, um, patient-derived uh, xenografts. And I, the minuses for me, the one thing I'm kind of worried about is that um, the IL-6 is being secreted by endothelial cells, and the the type of of I don't think the binding and the dynamics are the same between mouse and human. So if they put this piece of human tissue in there and it's fed really by mouse vessels, I think there might be some, um, some differences in um, binding dynamics. I don't think um, mouse and human um, um, IL-6 bind the same ways. So that's one of my concerns. The other concern is I, it's new to me, to be honest. I know PDX has been around for a long time, but it's new to me as a mathematician. Um, so I'm just worried about how to actually change our model to, um, to match the initial condition that they use for the PDX, which is a fully integrated tissue environment already. It's not just cells, which I know exactly how many cells they put in and exactly how many cancer cells and how many endothelial cells in in the, in the current setup. With PDX, it's a full piece of tissue that they're putting in, and I don't know what those initial conditions are. So I have some concerns um, about using that approach. But um, I, I'm trusting my experimental collaborators to have good reasons for wanting to make the switch. I think they believe that it's just um, more, it more closely replicates human tumor growth, I guess. Um, and that's what they're aiming for. So, yeah. Can you please explain how the cisplatin increases uh, the stem cells? So that's a good question, and I don't actually know exactly what cisplatin is doing at the molecular level to, um, in, to increase stem cell um, self renewal, but there is some evidence that it seems like it is doing that. So I, I was saying they, don't, they were wondering if it's a numerator or a denominator effect, the fact that we get more stem cells. We know it's definitely a denominator effect, right? We know we get more stem cells because we're killing off other cells, making the denominator smaller, making the whole thing bigger. But um, there's now starting to be some evidence that cisplatin may also be triggering something in these stem cells. I don't know what that is. But, yeah. uh, also, have you considered BCL2 as a target instead of VTF? No, BCL2. Oh, BCL2 as a target, yes. So we actually have uh, a paper out that looks at targeting BCL2. And um, actually, it works pretty well according to our mathematical model because it's, it's downstream of VEGF. And once you block BCL2, not only are you blocking survival, but you're blocking some things that are downstream of, v, of BCL2, which is the upregulation of these other uh, pro, uh, proliferative and migratory uh, responses. So actually, I, I wish I had some slides to show you, but our, our, our results for, for blocking BCL2 actually in some cases look better than um, sequestering the EGF. What, what's special about your model in head and neck cancers? So can, can you use this model if you have data from breast cancer and use it to model the same? Absolutely, yes. So there's nothing that ties this model to head and neck cancer other than the parameters. The framework itself is very, very general. If I had this level of data for breast cancer or another type of cancer, I could certainly use the same approach. Yeah. And then my, my other question is, uh, do you know the mice that they use for, for gathering the data? Is it not the actual brief, but uh, did they have an immune component? Um, so no, these are immune deficient mice, okay. yes. So, so you've given a great example of how a mathematical model can can sort of serve the role of an insulin called testing suite. Right? Yeah. So if you were to speculate just for a minute or two, what do you think it will take from your point of view before, say, the results of this show up in a in a tumor board that that determines the treatment for a particular patient? That's a very good question. Um, and I have a sort of an example. So along the, when we first started um, doing these 
models back in um, 2007. Um, our results were looking really good. Our collaborator here is um, also an acting physician, and so is, so is Alex. And um, they asked us to test out different um, dosing strategies, high dose, low frequency, low, low dose, um, high frequency strategies, and to see what, um, what, was, what the model predicted was best. We predicted low dose, high frequency. They went and did further testing and testing and testing. And they were able to try those strategies out on actual patients with head and neck cancer at Michigan. Um, so that was a very big perk. And they actually give, give the modeling some credit to, to leaning them towards that direction. Um, and so for this work, I think um, we're not there yet. I mean, that took years and years and years. Um, uh, we're not quite there yet. But I think something like that could very easily happen because I'm working with um, uh, researchers who also practice and who also have a, a, a mechanism to get what we're doing to patients. Yeah. Just as a follow-up to the question, <clears throat> wouldn't this require FDA approval? Oh, absolutely. As a, as a mechanism for, for signing the treatment? Uh, uh, F, uh, oh, uh, so the drugs definitely have to be FDA No, no, no I'm talking about the modeling as a device for predicting. Oh, interesting. I think so. Ah, that's a good, I, I don't think my model is FDA approved, so <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. So modeling needs to be FDA approved. It's a device, yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. I mean, the FDA certainly, I mean, I've, I've discussed this with FDA people maybe 10, 15 years ago. They yeah. knew at that time that they needed to gear up on mathematical modeling they because did. soon they would have okay. so something. Can I just say, I think in practice that you're, you're essentially stipulating a quote off-label use unquote. Yeah. So I do think I'm not an expert, but I think IRBs may have some latitude there. Local. Oh. IRBs. Yeah. For for specific cases, for but off-label. Right. Yeah. That's you interesting. You may have to have a big dossier underneath what the FDA would be interested in. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's a very interesting point. Um, so I think that my collaborators use the modeling as an idea. Of, as a guide for what they might want to further experimentally test. So when they actually do this, it's not because necessarily just because the model said, <laughs> said to do it. It's because they have tested and tested and tested and tested. And, right. So they, yeah. It was the model it's not, it's was kind of a guide. It's not a criticism. I mean, yeah, I under, I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> I'm aware that, um, yeah. you know, going directly to patients might actually require yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, obviously, can, you, can I just ask, in the yeah. case you cited where your clinicians did take advantage, was the data from PDX in that case? No, it was not from PDX in that case. Yeah, this PDX stuff is, is um, their new ideas of how, how they want to do it. But yeah, not, that wasn't PDX. What would you think about 3D as opposed to 3, uh, PDX because of the lack of mouse vasculature? What would I think about if you, if you had a 3D model? Oh, yeah. It was solely human based. Right. Versus the that would that would match the PDX uh, much much better. So yeah, I think it, and if we if we find some collaborators who want to do some 3D mo modeling of this kind of thing, then I think I would be maybe more comfortable with PDX in that setting. Yep. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much.